sending you, during this class, I'm going to be sending you your final grade for the report. Sorry about that. I was going to try to send it earlier, but I didn't get a chance to. I wanted to, before we have our wonderful speaker come and talk to you about traumatic brain injury and the ways that we can use imaging to uh, elucidate some of what's going on, I wanted to just have a brief follow-up on the talk that we heard on Monday. Because you guys are probably wondering, what do I really need to know from that talk when it comes to a quiz or when it comes to the final? So I just wanted to have a little chat with you about that and kind of highlight the main points. <clears throat> so first of all, what did the speaker talk to us about? Okay, and what is bioluminescence? What do you guys think bioluminescence is? Chemiluminescence is living things. Okay, and what's chemiluminescence? Light made by a chemical reaction. So when you've got a chemical reaction happening inside of a living thing that results in the giving off of light, because you've got chemical reactions going on all over the place, right? I mean, that's what we are. We are chemical reactions central. If you've got specific ones that generate light, then those are called bioluminescent reactions. Okay? Now, how does that differ from fluorescence? Sorry? Correct. Correct. That's one difference. Any other differences between fluorescence and bioluminescence? Yes. Which one? So the duration, right? Because what happens with fluorescence? <laughs> the moment you take away the light source that's pumping in the energy into the fluorescent system, the light goes away. Instead of bioluminescence, it's a question of your chemicals running out. Right? Remember they said that our speaker told us that they would be able to image the mouse half an hour, an hour, it depends, sometimes five minutes, depending on what the chemical reaction was and how fast it extinguished itself. And he talked, what did he say that was different about the bacteria, using the bacteria as compared to using like luciferase and luciferin? So when they were doing most of those studies with luciferin and luciferase, they had to actually inject luciferin. As remember, he told us they spent about $400,000 in buying luciferin, a kilogram of luciferin a year. Okay? So they have to inject that stuff, and once it's run out, the light's gone. But with the bacterial system, the bacteria itself generates all of the components it needs for the chemical reaction so they continue to grow. So fluorescence, you've got to put an external light source in. The moment the light source is gone, the light is gone. Bioluminescence, the chemical reaction. How about phosphorescence? How does phosphorescence <coughs> differ from these others? You okay? Uh, what about phosphorescence? Um, similar to fluorescence, we've got to use like, like taking an engine in order to produce more light. The forbidden triplet state. Yes. <coughs> so do you guys understand that? Fluorescence and phosphorescence need an external light source to, in a sense, pump in the energy. Fluorescence gives off light right away back. And the moment the external light source is gone, the light's gone. Phosphorescence, you need the external light source to pump energy in. The light continues to be re-emitted for seconds, minutes. Bioluminescence is a form of chemiluminescence, and you have a chemical reaction that's generating the light. Okay? Those are very important components for you guys to understand. <clears throat> now, one last thing I want to make sure you guys have clear. What can you tell me about the light that you have to pump in for both phosphorescence and fluorescence as compared to the light that you get out? Yeah, you don't get anything for nothing. Okay? There's no perpetual motion machine here. You don't put in low energy light and get higher energy light out. Okay? There are some tricks for doing that. There are some bizarre rare earth crystals that will, when you put an energy in, they will pump out a light that's a different, that's a higher energy color. But they do it because the amount of photons put in is 98 is is uh, 50 times more than the amount of photons you get out. They do a special trick, but we're not worried about that right now. Those are called up-converting crystals. Right? Wait, so the, the number of photons out in 
fewer, but they're at higher energy levels. Yeah. I mean, these upconverting crystals. Those are things that are put in spandex, believe it or not, and they're put in money. There are ways of detecting counterfeit spandex and counterfeit money. Uh, it, but don't worry, we're not going to be covering that. These are bizarre little things that happen in the secret world of uh, espionage and counter counter uh, terrorism and all these kinds of different things that happen. They use some of these things. But, <clears throat> okay, so that was one thing. Now, how the heck did they use bioluminescence? The, the speaker talked to us at Stanford. What do they do with this bioluminescent reaction? So they use it to tag different bacteria or Okay. So what kind of thing? Tell me a little more. Um, they can like have it directly as part of like a virus, so that if they can like how the virus spreads, it would light up wherever it's in the body. Okay. Okay. It doesn't need to tag like cancer or track the metastasis. So what does it mean to track cancer? Like how? What do you like? Do they inject something into this mouse and make the cancer cells all of a sudden have a chemical reaction? That generates the bioluminescence or something else? The, the, the gene that codes for a certain bioluminescent bacteria, and they splice it into the genome of other bacteria or cancer cells, whatever they have, and they inject it in. So you do hybrid cells and watch how they do this. So, this is the important, very important point. They've genetically modified that organism so that whenever a cancer or some other thing they're looking at, like a heat shock protein, whatever they're looking at. When that particular protein is expressed or made, along with it, it makes the things that you need for the bioluminescent reaction. But it doesn't make everything you need for the bioluminescent reaction. It makes the luciferase, and then the luciferase is put in. Okay? So, wherever you have this chemical reaction, this light emitted, is where that gene product has been made. So you have to genetically modify this mouse to create luciferase wherever you are trying to study something happening. So whenever that gene is turned on, and you pick a gene that's related to that cancer, whenever that gene is turned on, you also generate this luciferase. And so in that area, you've got this material there ready to bioluminesce once you add the missing ingredient. Okay? Yes. So when they take that gene, do they put that bioluminescent gene into the cancer cell or into the mouse? So there's different techniques, but usually they make it to some kind of product that's related to the cancer or related to the disease they're trying to study. Now, if they're studying bacterial infection and the bacteria already grow themselves, then they don't need to do that. Bacteria already grow. But the problem they have with the bacteria growing, remember something about the bacteria growing, the color? It was blue. What do we know about blue inside of an organism in terms of trying to get out? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> blue does not go through tissue very well. When we stuck our blue LED on our finger, we didn't see much. When we stuck the white light on our finger, our finger didn't glow blue. It glowed red or orangish red. Okay. So I, I asked them later, well, why don't you guys make a bacteria that will glow in the, in the red. And he said, people try all the time, but it's very hard. Usually you get incremental changes, and you, get, you can change that wavelength a little bit at a time to genetic changes and trying to do these large trials where you try to find mutants that have changed in that direction. And to go from 473 to like 650 nanometers is a huge change. It would require a lot of change in the, in the structure, which they haven't been able to find. When they do it with the luciferin, luciferase, and those other reactions, they've had to go not as far. So they've been able to shift it towards, I think, 615 was the best that they found they talked about. They were shifting it, start, starting to shift into the line. I was just going to say, you know, like, change the firefly, and you just Yeah, exactly. So they were able to change that one to go a little bit into the orange. So that's why they like that one so much. Okay? And remember what we were talked about with the hair, the mouse hair? Which mice were the best to study? Sorry? The naked mice or hairless mice, we're going to call them. And what was the next best? <laughs> and what did they do to even the white mice? Yeah. They nailed them. Okay, to get rid of the hair. Okay, and why might you do that? 
Because white, you know, white doesn't absorb light, right? Why might you get? Why might you mirror the mice? Because white scatters the light. Yeah, white will scatter the light. Okay. So think of it as almost like both the idea of the, all these little fibers there that light is scattering off of, and also just the fact that they could be reflecting the light back into the mouse rather than letting it get out. Okay. So you guys get the basic ideas of what was going on and how bioluminescence was being used. Okay, now he did not talk about fluorescence being used in this way. He did not talk about phosphorescence being used in this way, but only bioluminescence. Okay? But I want to tie it back to the speaker that we had before him, who was studying HIV transmission. What did he use? Did he use bioluminescence? Did he use fluorescence? Or did he use phosphorescence? Green fluorescent fluorescence. He used green fluorescent protein, affectionately known as GFP. Okay? <clears throat> And there, he was able to attach that to part of the HIV virus, okay? This green fluorescent protein. And the virus is this little thing, and the protein is this big thing attached to that virus. They were able to attach it in such a way that it still remains with the virus, and the virus still infects other things, okay? And in that case, he had to shine, in his case, he had to shine a bluish light onto the cells. And then he blocked out the blue light from what he saw in his microscope. And he only looked for green light. And he saw where the HIV was. Now, he had two tags in his. Some of the pictures he showed you had a red color and a green color. There he had to do, he had to shine light. And he actually had a filter that would only show him the green. And he had another filter that would only show him the red. And there he could see where the cells were in general, because everything was labeled with the red. The, the new cells, the non-infected cells, were labeled with the red in it. And the infected cells were labeled with the green. And then you could see where the green went into the red cells. Okay. You guys remember that? Okay. So that one was looking at a cellular mechanism. The one that we saw uh, on Monday was looking at a whole, uh, an organism. And a big thing going on. Yes. Did he use fluorescence? <coughs> he didn't have to keep adding things different and keep it shine light. But he didn't. So what would be the advantage of tagging the mouse, because they could have genetically modified this mouse to create green fluorescent protein, right? And they do. There are mice that have green fluorescent protein, the things that are genetically modified. What would be the advantage of one versus the other? In the kind of studies that they were doing, why is he more likely to pick bioluminescence than to pick fluorescent tag? Well, because if he had used fluorescence, he would have had to somehow get a light source inside the mouse. Yes. Okay? So it's a number of steps, basically. So I've got something inside the organism, and I'm now shining blue light. Is what I, that's what I need to excite my green fluorescent protein. i got to shine blue light in. i got to get enough of that for those tags. And then I'm going to get green light out. Now I'm kind of stuck in both directions. I'm kind of reducing my signal in both, in both areas. But if I can make the inside of the mouse glow orange out, then I've got a better chance of seeing what's going on. Okay? Does that make sense? OK. OK, with that said, <coughs> I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Gene Gurkoff. He's going to come talk to you about basic neuroscience and neurophotonics, but really his big thing is traumatic brain injury, which has garnered a lot of attention, uh, unfortunately, since the start of the war, the wars, and uh, a lot of poor soldiers have had these kinds of injuries, but he will give you a more, uh, an experience more down to, uh, not, not related to the war, yeah. that where traumatic brain injury comes to be. But um, feel free to ask him any questions. He's incredibly friendly. Prior classes have really enjoyed this talk. So um, there we go. Were the last two talks Chris, Contag, and Greg? Yeah. So unlike your last two speakers who are very much into biophotonics in general, <clears throat> I am not really a biophotonics guy. I am a neuroscience guy. I did my undergraduate in neuroscience. I did my lab work in neuroscience, my PhD in neuroscience. It's only when I came up to UC Davis three years ago that I started learning about biophotonics. And so what they call me as an end user. I'm a neuroscientist who used biophotonics to study my questions. So I think my talk will be different from a lot of the talks you'll hear here because it comes from that perspective. So I don't know how much background you guys have in neuroscience, so I'm just going to go very basic. So the most basic way to describe it is the study of the nervous system, which is what I do. And uh, one of the reasons I got into neuroscience is because it's so diverse. <clears throat> so uh, 
there was this huge list on Wikipedia, and I just pulled down a bunch I thought was interesting and bolded the ones that I've actually been involved in in the lab. <clears throat> so in neuroscience, we span anatomy, psychology, evolutionary biology, developmental biology, computer science, biophotonics, et cetera, et cetera. So what's really cool about it is I go into the lab, and month to month, I'm sometimes doing something very different, and it keeps me constantly on my feet and constantly learning, which is, again, what drew me to the field. <clears throat> These are just some examples of different kinds of neurons. Um, depending on where you are and what your job is, you have a very different phenotype or a very different look. Um, all these cells have a few things in common. One is a cell body or a soma. See, they all have that. And they all have uh, axons. And the axon, in the most simplistic uh, form, is how neurons send signals out. So how they talk to the neurons next to them. All neurons have dendrites, so these are these these guys here, and that's the receiving end. So that's where information comes in. So it's a very uh, simple setup there. And I just threw in some pictures of my neurons in a couple cases. So this is a uh, this is a culture where I've got astrocytes, which are support cells, and the neurons here on top. You can see they have cell bodies and these dendrites that are shooting out. This is just a stain that gets absorbed into the membrane. So I just put on this dye. I wait half an hour, take it off and my cells are green. Over here, this is actually taken from the hippocampus, which is a brain region of an injured rat. And uh, again, this is also a stain. And you can see these dark bodies here are actually the neurons because they don't take up the stain. But when the neuron's dying, it becomes acidic, and you see these little acidic neurons here. So these are just examples of what neurons look like when we look in tissue. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have all heard of the action potential before, so this is kind of key to some of the things I do. I figured I'd go over it. So cells have a resting potential of minus 70. So that means it's very negative charge inside the cell. And when you have a signal coming from, a from an axon to a dendrite that activates the neighboring cell, uh, sodium channels open. So sodium is very high outside the cell, and it's very low inside the cell, so there's this gradient. Sodium runs into the cell. Sodium has a positive charge. So you see the inside of the cell start to depolarize. It gets more positive. As it gets more positive, potassium channels open. So they have the opposite setup as sodium. They're really high inside the cell and really low outside the cell. So the, the gradient's opposite. So potassium starts to flow out. At the same time, sodium channels begin to close. So now you have less sodium coming in and more so potassium going out. So you get to this point where you equalize up around plus 40. Then what happens is the channels become totally closed, so there's just potassium leaving until you come back down to the, the reset down here, and then the sodium channels open, and we can do this all over again. And this is the basic way that we have those neurons and how they talk with one another. And again, the, the, the important points are sodium is high outside, low inside, which allows it to depolarize. Potassium is low outside and high inside, which allows it to repolarize. So this is my crude drawing of an axon here and a dendrite here. And uh, here's your action potential. So what happens is it moves from the cell body down the axon and it gets down to the terminal here. So again, your sodium's coming in and your potassium's coming out. And in neuroscience, I, I'm guessing you've all heard of neurotransmitters. So the key to, to how cells communicate is there's a change from this electrical signal, right, going from positive to negative, or negative to positive, I should say, into a chemical signal. So these I'm calling glutamate, which is the major excitatory neurotransmitter. So it excites the neighboring cell. So as the action potential gets down to the axon, glutamate's released, and then it binds these postsynaptic receptors. And what this does is it causes sodium and calcium to come in, which will be very important to some of the stuff I talk about later, and potassium to come out. And then the signal just moves on down to the soma. So this is how neurons communicate with one another. And so that's, that's it. That's your basic neuroscience lecture. That's all I'm going to go with. And now I'm going to jump into some of the science and uh, some of the things that drew me to neuroscience again. And uh, I'm going to give you uh, two examples of advances in mind control using neuroscience. So this is, this is a rat brain. And the part of the rat brain I'm interested in here is the ventral tegmental area right here. And this is, a, is a, known as a group of neurons close to the midline of the midbrain, so we know where they are, right there. And um, this is the origin of dopaminergic cells, or cells that make dopamine. 
And what's cool about the VTA is that it's implicated in natural reward, drug addiction, and motivational circuitry. So like when you have cocaine on board, you're activating these cells here and causing dopamine to go out and you get a lot of reward. Um, there's also another area of the rat brain that we know a lot about, and it's the barrel cortex. So this is a sensory system. So the barrel cortex is this dark uh, staining region in the sensory cortex of the rat where information comes in about whisker movement. So you see these little black boxes here? So with every whisker on the mouse, you can actually go in and look at the brain and there's this, you can actually see where each whisker comes into the sensory cortex. Um, these neurons that are in these barrels respond uh, specifically to whisker displacement for one whisker. So this cell will only respond if this whisker is moved. And furthermore, there's directional sensitivity. So some of the neurons, it's not just when this whisker moves, it's when this whisker moves this way or this whisker moves that way. And that's how they use their whiskers and how cats use their whiskers to navigate. So there's this hypothetical situation. So we know that electrons are electrochemical, right? Where an action potential moves down the neuron, stimulates neurotransmitter release, okay? And we know that um, if you stimulate in the VTA, you release dopamine, which is like a drug reward. So what would happen if you activate the VTA only when a rat does what you want it to do? And so these guys had this idea. A building falls down, say in like Haiti, there's an earthquake, a building comes down, there's rubble everywhere. The current model is you have a dog which goes around and sniffs and tries to find people who are alive. The problem with dogs is they're quite big, and some of the cracks in these buildings are quite small. And they thought, well, what if we could have a rat do the dog's work? So they took an electrode, and they put it in the ventral tegmental area, so the reward area. And then they took two more electrodes, and they put one in the barrel cortex for whiskers on this side, and one in the barrel cortex for whiskers on this side. And then they'd have a remote control. And they'd, they'd hook this little backpack up so that they had this stimulus coming in. So this is a remote control, like you have an RC car, right? And so when they went right, the whiskers for the right side were stimulated. And if the rat actually turned right when the, when the whiskers were stimulated, it got a drug, drug reward, right? The VTA was stimulated. So it's like giving him a cocaine burst if he does what you want him to do. If you go left, then you give him a reward when you go left on the remote control. And eventually what they could do is they could teach these rats to run an obstacle course. Go up a ladder, across a plank, down around, to weave in inside, outside of blocks. So then all you have to do is put a little camera, video camera, on there, and you could, in theory, remote control a rat and have him search through rubble for a survivor. So this is one really cool uh, application of neuroscience. Um, another one, and this one is actually quite hot right now, um, is having to do with the motor cortex. So the primary motor cortex, which we call M1, which is up in here, is the region of your brain that basically controls your motor function. Um, in humans and primates, it works in association with the premotor cortex to plan your movements. And so if you want to move your arms, information comes from your motor cortex down into your spinal cord and you execute the actual movements. So what happens in spinal cord injury, right, is the brain is disconnected from the spinal cord, like this. And depending on the spinal injury, frequently everything up here is okay and everything down there is okay. It just can't communicate with one another anymore, and so you can't move. And so the, the thought was, you know, the big thought was, what if we could just reconnect? What if we could take the brain that's intact and the spinal cord that's intact and kind of reconnect them? That, that was the big theory. But the first one is they had to see how do the brain and the spinal cord work together. So um, what they wanted to do was use the brain to control an artificial limb. And they've done this. So they had a primate, and he sits in a chair. And what you do is, the day before the test or the day of the test, you give him less water than he's used to, so he's a little thirsty. And you set up a juice dispenser. So if he does what you want him to do, you give him juice. And he's thirsty and he likes juice, it's sweet, so he'll, he'll learn tasks very quickly. And what you do is you have a screen where dots appear. And when the dot appears, the, the, the monkey's job is just to touch the dots. And they put an electrode, multi-electrode array into the motor cortex. Remember I showed you that motor cortex M1. And they're just recording what activity is coming out of the brain. So when the monkey moves here, what is the brain doing? When the monkey moves here, what is the brain doing? And then they use a mathematical algorithm. And they said, OK, so when the, when the brain fires like this, the arm moves like that and like that. And they hooked it up to a mechanical arm. So they had the, then they had the primate reaching. And right next to him, the mechanical arm is reaching also. And then they'd fine-tune it. So eventually the mechanical arm was doing exactly what the primate's arm was doing. 
And then what they did is they strapped the primate's arm down, you know, just so he couldn't move it, and had the dots come up on the screen. Now, if the primate was good at it, he could use his mind to control the artificial arm, because they plugged the electrode array into the artificial arm, and the artificial arm would actually go and touch the screen. So the primate could use its brain to control a mechanical arm sitting next to it to touch a screen so he could get juice. So effectively, you don't need the activity going down your spinal cord anymore. You can control it with your brain. So a lot of what people are trying to do today is, is there a way to reconnect your brain, which is intact, with your motor system, which is intact, to try to recover function? So those were just um, two really cool neuroscience experiments I thought I'd, I'd throw out there to, to show you why I got so into this and how there's uh, really wide applications for it. Um, now I'm kind of going to move into neurophotonics, which is a, a new field of using biophotonics to study neuroscience. And this here, I don't know, has anybody here seen the brainbow mice before? Okay, so a few people have. So this is a brainbow mouse, and it's basically uh, each of these my, the, these mice will express lots of different fluorescent markers, and depending on which ones are expressed in any given cell, you get a different color. And it's a way to study individual neurons in a very large system. Right? For me, it's just a cool picture at this point. So I'll continue on with my uh, what happens if kind of paradigms. And this is actually a study that my wife was doing for her PhD, so this was close to home for me. She was studying a degenerative disease that caused motor dysfunction. And what she was trying to do is look at the interactions of different neuron populations and culture to determine what caused these cells to die. And one of the problems is there were two cells. They were actually dopamine cells, but they expressed different uh, proteins. So they looked identical in a dish, and she wanted to look at them individually. I want to look at this dopamine cell versus this dopamine cell to see how they are different in this injury. And so how do you do that? Well, up until fairly recently, what people would do is use what's called differential interference contrast. You basically have a polarizing filter and a prism, and it gives you depth, and you can see your cell, here's your soma, and these are all dendrites coming off here. And it's great. She was going in with an electrode and wanted to get right up to them and patch onto them so she could see them and patch onto them. But you really can't tell any differences between these cells except in the, their shape. So this is exactly what we were talking about at the very beginning of the class about uh, some of the previous speakers. They use genetics to address this problem. So remember, they're interested in a, a dopamine gene. So say here's your gene of interest. In her case, it was a dopamine receptor 1. And it has a very specific promoter to get this gene. So at the end of it, they just put an enhanced GFP protein, or green fluorescent protein. So now any time a cell makes DR1, it also makes GFP. So this here is a DR1 expressing cell. And when you have your, this is just a mercury arc lamp, so just normal fluorescence, you see this nice green cell. So again, she wanted to know uh, how these two cells, D1 and D2, differed. When she started her PhD, this is what the cells look like, and she had no idea which one was which. But by the end of her PhD, she could use these genetically modified mice and identify specifically, is this a D1 cell, is this a D2 cell, and then design her hypotheses to see um, how these two are affected differently from the disease. So this is really breakthrough. Um, another really breakthrough study, and this is a friend of mine at UCLA is actually doing this study, is what they wanted to know is how behavioral training affects synapse number, synapse size, synapse shape. So synapse is where the axon and the dendrite meet um, in animals. And the way we used to do this, if you wanted to know synapse number or size, is you'd sacrifice the animal. So you'd perfuse the animal with a fixative, you'd cut the animal up, and then you'd sit there and actually count these things. So it's impossible to ask how behavior or experience affects these because you have to know what it's like before and after the behavior, and you can only sacrifice an animal once. So how do you deal with this? Um, one of the ideas was to do something like use X-ray or MRI or CAT scan, but the resolution is really bad. You can't see single cells, let alone single synapses. And as we were talking about in the beginning of class, you can't just shine a blue light on a rat body and expect to get something back out. The signal's too weak. So what did he do? He did two things. The first thing they did is they took the, the, the head and they shaved off the, the fur. They did an incision, opened it up and saw the, the skull, and they drilled a small circle in the skull and just took off a little circle piece of skull. Then they put a piece of optical glass in where the skull used to be and glued it down. And then they used two photon, which is a uh, 
kind of imaging technique. Could you guys learn about two photon yet? No, you haven't learned about two photon yet. So I'll do my best to go into this again. I'm a neuroscience guy. So what they have is an, an infrared laser. And they have a target here. And basically, the lower, the, the longer wavelengths will penetrate the tissue better, but they're unable to stimulate the fluorophore. So what they do is they split it into two, and then they refocus it down into one spot. And so it penetrates really well, and then when it reaches the, the sample, the two photons arrive at the same time, creating enough energy to actually stimulate the fluorescence. And you get the fluorescence coming back out, and they can read it here. And so what he's got here, so PND here means postnatal day. And so these are um, mice, and these again, he took advantage of green fluorescent protein technology, and he, it's on a promoter that's expressed in neurons in a specific region of the brain. So this is part of the cortex. And so this is the same mouse at day 16 after it's born and day 25 after it's born. And what these are is these are dendrites. And what you can see here is between 16 and 25 days, there's a huge outgrowth in dendrites, right? There's this huge explosion. And how do you study this? Well, he said, look, here's this little anatomical structure here. You can see it kind of bends around here and bends around there. It's right there. So he can actually go in and study the same spot in the brain day after day after day after day. So he would focus in just on one dendrite. So this is one dendrite. And you can see it's the same dendrite in the same space, the same orientation. And all these little dots coming off here, those are spines. This is where the synapses are. And so he can go in and say, is the synapse there every day? So here you see this guy. It's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. It's here the whole time. Whereas this blue guy here, there's a, a synapse there, a synapse there, and now he's gone. And he can actually track synapses in an animal over an extended period of time. Then the next step would be, let's do certain behaviors, let's do certain activities, and see how that affects this number. So um, in summary at this point, neuroscience is a very multidisciplinary field, right? We do everything from cell biology, molecular biology, genetics, engineering, photonics, um, which I think makes it very exciting. I think the other key, as you saw from all my what-if examples, is that technology is a key driver for the research we do. And biophotonics is actually the current hot technology that many neuroscientists are using across the country. And uh, yeah, I'd say that the, the recent marriage of biophotonics and neuroscience has led us to a much better understanding of how the nervous system works. And right now I'll throw in a break, and then when we come back I'll start talking about how I specifically use biophotonics in my lab to study concussion. So what I study for a living is concussion. <clears throat> uh, the reason I got into concussion is, I actually never played football. My mom wouldn't let me. I always wanted to. I understand better now why my mom was worried. Um, but I still played soccer, baseball, basketball. I was ADD, crashing around, hit my head a bunch of times. And um, one of the things I hated most uh, when I played sports is not being allowed to play. You know, like you twist your ankle, you have to sit out, and everybody else is out there. And uh, one of the things that's come up recently in the past 10 years is this idea that if you've had a concussion, you can't play. And there's this question, well, why can't you play? And when can you come back to play? And has anybody here heard of anecdotal evidence? Does anybody know what anecdotal evidence means? Exactly. It's stories. So people tell you stories. And there's no scientific knowledge. You just know, well, this person seemed to get better around now, and this person seemed to get better around now. And, and so this idea of why can't you play with a concussion and when can you come back from a concussion, no real science had been done to ask, you know, how do we assess that? And so that's kind of what sucked me in because I wanted, I love football, I love soccer and baseball, and I, I wanted to know how do you keep people on the field when they want to be there, you know, when is it good to get, go back in? And so that's what kind of sucked me in. Um, and one of the things I, I, I like to throw into this lecture is the idea of the scientific method. So I know when I was in high school, probably even in middle school, people would talk to me about the scientific method, but it was all kind of meaningless until I got into lab and actually started doing it. So what I'm going to do for you guys today is I'm going to kind of weave my research in with scientific method to try to give you a real-life example of how this really works. <clears throat> so the scientific methods, you start with a, a background knowledge or a broad question. So what I'm going to throw at you guys next is kind of my background knowledge about TBI, what I think is important for you guys. 
And then what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to generate a hypothesis, which is a discrete and testable question. We'll get into this in a little bit more detail. Um, then I'm going to design my experiment. Oh, go ahead. Let me get back to it, okay? Yeah, well, we'll come back to it. Um, then I'm going to design methods. I'm going to execute my data. And I'm going to interpret whether the data was right or wrong. And what we find when we start doing experiments for real is that right and wrong is frequently not the answer you get. It's other. It's something completely unexpected, which is one of the, uh, the joys and the horrors of doing this for a living. <clears throat> um, and then you take all this information, and you make a new hypothesis, and you start all over again. And so this is what we do every day. Um, what I think is interesting about this is it doesn't just apply to hard sciences. This actually applies to just about everything we do in our daily life. And, and one of my favorites right now is like the stimulus package, right? The banks collapse. The government decides to go in and bail out the banks and to give money to states to try to create jobs. And there is, so we know that the economy is collapsing and we know that there's no jobs and we know that there's money. And then you come up with a hypothesis. Some people say the way to create jobs is to reduce taxes for businesses because then businesses will have more money and they can hire. Somebody else says, well, the best way is to actually take tax dollars and inject it into businesses to hire jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And so those are examples of two different hypotheses. And then it's the job of those people coming up with those hypotheses to design ways of analyzing what's going on. What happens when we cut taxes? What happens when we throw dollars in? How many jobs are created? How long do they last? Then to interpret and integrate the data and come up with a new hypothesis. And I think what's also great about this example is you can ask two people this after we've gone through several rounds of hypothesis design and testing, and they still disagree, which gets us to kind of this other. There's frequently multiple ways. But the reality is the scientific method isn't just used in science. It's used in our everyday life for just about anything. So, okay, traumatic brain injury is defined as damage to the brain resulting from an external mechanical force, right? So a stroke is brain injury. It's not traumatic brain injury because it's not an external mechanical force. Examples would be rapid acceleration or deceleration. So that's like if you're in a car accident, your head goes forward and back. Um, impact, which would be like football. Blast waves, which is what the soldiers are getting in the Middle East right now when there's an explosion close by. There's an incredible amount of force which physically moves the brain. Or penetration by a projectile, like getting shot. So those are all different kinds of traumatic brain injuries. And so does anyone here know what a concussion is? How to define a concussion? Not when you the brain, the brain moves the point of Okay, and can you, how do you tell that from different brain injuries? Do you know that? Usually it's actually not going to get so far as a bruise, but you have it basically right, right? Your head is going, like say your head strikes an object, like you hit a table. Your brain is going to physically move inside the cranium. It's surrounded by fluid, and it's going to impact the front of the skull. Then there's actually a vacuum which's created back here, and it's going to move back and slap the back side of the skull. What differentiates a concussion from so many other injuries is if I take this person who's had this concussive type injury and put them in an MRI or a CT scanner, I'm not going to see anything. There's going to be no gross pathology. They're going to look like you and me, but they've had a concussion. Um, how about a subdural hematoma? Does anybody know what that is? Does anybody know what the dura is? OK, cool. So you have a brain. You have your skull. And then there's these meninges. It's kind of like this protective layer that goes around the brain. So the pia is this really thin matter that's right on top of the brain. There's a subarachnoid space in between, and that's where your blood vessels are. And on top of that's the dura, which is this very thick, firm covering. And it kind of keeps the brain separate from everything else. So when something's subdural, that means it's below the dura. And a hematoma means blood. Does anybody know what edema is? A bruise, it's swelling. So can anybody tell me the difference between, say, bruising your arm and bruising your brain? Go ahead. That's exactly it. Swelling in the brain is horrible because the skull is on the outside. On your arm, if you get a bruise, it just swells up. It's got everywhere to go. If the brain swells, it swells into the skull and crushes itself. So what does this look like? This is a CT scan up here, and this is an MRI scan down here. 
And what you can see in the CT, these black spaces, that's where fluid is in your brain. And it's supposed to be a mirror image. There should be a ventricle here and a ventricle here. But you can see the brain is swelling. This, this part of the brain is totally swelling over to the other side. So this is what edema looks like in a human brain. Down here, you see this white here? That's also fluid. So this is where the normal, normal brain fluid is in here. And you can see it's only on one side because there's swelling here getting rid of the other. But you see all this white out here? That's blood. That's blood underneath the dura. And so when blood gets on your brain, it kills your brain real quick. And so this person has what's called the subdural hematoma. And what I study in traumatic brain injury is the first example. I'm more interested in concussions um, than in subdural hematomas and uh, swelling. Um, so what does concussion look like? Uh, again, I said I like football, so I found a good football example for us. This was not this season, but last season. Uh, in a game, Arizona, uh, I thought it was Pittsburgh, but I'm not 100% sure. Ball goes down the middle of the receiver, and he's down. And there's a couple things you'll see. Guy comes over right away. That's how serious concussions are. His feet are crossed. So that's a fixed reaction that happens when you have this kind of impact. The brain is activated, and it's a stereotype reaction. The trainer's out on the field in less than a minute, right? This is how critical and important concussions can be. And again, this guy didn't have any gross abnormalities when they looked at him on a scanner, but he was clearly very messed up. So one, two, and then here comes a third hit. Boom, right on the ground. When your helmet hits the ground, right? You have that impact. Your brain hits the skull, the vacuum, and you get another one. So one, two, and three impacts on the head. And so this is an example of a really nasty concussion. But he didn't have any subdural hematoma or subpeal hematomas. He didn't have any really big swelling. It was a concussion. And he had to stay out for a long period of time. He actually had a lot of facial damage, too. But. Um, if they don't work this way, is that the way to conclude that they're That's a very good question. And uh, there are some ways to tell if they've had concussions, such as like the stereotype reactions, right? He had the crossing. Your pupils can dilate. You can be unconscious for a period of time. You can be unconscious and still be concussed. A lot of it will be behavioral, that they will start to behave differently. But what's interesting, I'll finish this real quick, is that back 30, 40 years ago, and this was true with like a lot of psychological disorders, they would put you in an x-ray or some sort of scan, and they would see nothing wrong, and they'd say, it's all in your head. Suck it up. Get better. And the reality is, yes, it is in their head, but any of this dysfunction is actually very real. You say, like, crossing your feet. Is that just like a, a nervous reaction? Or... It's a stereotype reaction that, for some reason, when everything gets activated at once, it's something that you frequently will see. There's another one called the uh, fencing response, and my buddy studies that. And he's got videos of guys, their arm just goes up like this. And it's because the brain is activated in a very certain way. And it doesn't always happen, but if you see it, it's a good indication that something has gone wrong. Uh, so this is, this is data from the Center for Disease Controls, and this is already a study that's 10 years old. And uh, I know the number's gone from 1.4 million up to 1.5 million. But every year, 1.5 million TBIs are reported in the US. Over 50,000 people die. A quarter of the million end up in the hospital. Uh, over a million end up in the emergency department. And actually, this number is wrong because a lot of people, when they can cu get concussions, like I actually had a concussion once, you don't actually go to the hospital. You just go home, and you don't receive medical care. So this is, this is a very large number of people. So I have a question. Anybody want to hazard a guess how much it costs if you have a severe head injury and you end up in our ICU for, say, a week? Let's take a guess. How much does a week cost? How much? No. Way low. A million dollars. Right? If you stay for two weeks and you're really bad, you can go up to $2 million. Okay. So this is, not, this is not a cheap thing. Um, so remember, that there's that idea of brain swelling, right? Brain swelling is really bad. Do you know what they do if they can't control your brain swelling? That's, that's one of the big things they'll do. They'll just take off a piece of your skull and let it swell out. But do you know what else they do? Do you think they do that when you're awake? They put you in a coma. So a lot of times when we have somebody in the ICU who's really severe, we induce a coma in them. So they actually put you out for a period of weeks. Um, so some of the, the diseases we talk a lot about in neuroscience are Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. 
they are very popular studied. A lot of people have them. Um, a lot of people have them in their families, so that there's this connection with them. But one of the things I want to point out is it's a average onset for Alzheimer's is 72 years old. Average onset for Parkinson's is 60 years old. So this is primarily happening in the elderly population. Um, now, cardiovascular disease is the number one disease in our country. It kills the same number of people that get any kind of trauma um, every year. So 1.4 million people die from heart disease. But again, what I'd like to point out here, this is men and women, red and white, and here's the percent of the population, and here's your age. This isn't happening in most people into your 50s and 60s. This is a disease of older people. TBI is the exact opposite. <clears throat> So what we have here is deaths in black, hospitalizations in gray, and emergency department visits here in the, in the orange. So uh, almost half a million children get a concussion every year, or a TBI, it's concussion or greater, and TBI is the number one cause of death and disability in children. So like these days we hear a lot about autism, which is growing and there's a lot of children that are disabled by it, but brain injury is the number one cause of disability in children. Um, and the second, the point I'd like to make here this is the second largest population, and if I'm correct, you guys are pretty much exclusively in that age range of 15 to 19 years old. So this is a, a, a neuroscience disease that's very relevant to people your age. Um, I'm starting to fall out of this graph, which is good. But uh, this is a disease of the young people. And you know, um, I once asked my dad, or I was once talking to my dad, actually, he was visiting me here on campus, and we were talking about seatbelt laws, and he felt that he grew up in an age where you didn't have to wear seatbelts. He only started wearing seatbelts when he was in his late 20s. And he said the only reason he wears a seatbelt is because he doesn't want the hassle of getting pulled over. And I yelled at him. And the reason I yelled at him is, uh, I think, summarized very well in this picture here. I mean, the obvious thing is she's immobilized and clearly not doing very well. She's hooked up to this expensive machinery, which is going to cost somebody a million dollars, but you notice how many people are around her? You know what happens if my dad goes through a windshield and ends up in the ICU? Do you think I'm going to go to work that day or the next day or the next day? Is my dad going to go to work for the next month and raise money to put food on the table and pay the mortgage? The answer is no. Um, when you get a head injury, it has a huge impact not just on yourself, but on your family and often cases on the community. And uh, that's what's summarized here. This was a correspondent who actually got too close to an improvised explosive device in Iraq. So the consequence is not just, well, it's just about me, because that's not true. All right, so here I'll jump in with a, a quick survey. How many of you think that your education is essential to your success in life? Honestly, because you're all here at UC Davis, and it's, it's, it's an obvious answer. Okay, um, have any of you here had a concussion before? So... Maybe two. Okay. So the rest of you, um, oh, I, I guess I should ask, what, what, how do you guys have a concussion? Do you remember anything about it? No? No? Not really? Did you get knocked out? Yeah. What were you doing? I, uh, I was playing low. I was to uh -huh. Hit your head and knocked yourself out? Yeah. How long were you out? Right. So, uh, so for the rest of you, does anybody here want a concussion? Right. And it's, again, it's an obvious answer. No, you don't want a concussion. Um, so honestly, um, every time I talk about TBI, whether it's in a science audience, actually there, there's one exception. If I'm talking in front of TBI people, I don't always say this, but someone always comes up to me afterwards and says, you know, I had a TBI, somebody had a, my family had a TBI and they have a question. Um, that's how prevalent it is. Every, but almost everybody has some experience with this somewhere. Um, one of my favorite examples, uh, this was a student in a crosswalk. Uh, my PhD ment mentor was actually a pediatric uh, neurologist. So he saw the brain injured patients after they came out of the ICU. And one of his patients was a high school student. She was a straight A student and a competitive dancer. She was at school and crossing the crosswalk. And, you know, when people are in the crosswalk, cars stop for people in the crosswalk. So there was about three cars stopped. And the fourth car back didn't know why people were stopped. He was in a hurry to get somewhere. So he just swerved around, gunned it, ran through the crosswalk, and through the person, giving her a fairly serious head injury. So she was out for a period of time, and she came back to school, and she no longer got straight A's. She was working harder than she worked before, and she was getting B's. She also had to stop dancing because she had some problems affiliated with the, with the injury as far as her motor control. and She just couldn't be at the same level that she was. Um, 
So again, you look at the brain, the brain looks normal, but for some reason it's not functioning the same. She's not achieving like she was in school before. Um, there was in fact a student in this class, was it three years ago now, Marco, or four years ago, who was on a bicycle and got hit on the bicycle? Okay. And she had to take a, a quarter or two off of school, because that's how long it took her to recover from the injury. Um, so these things have a lasting effect. I actually got really lucky with my story. I was a, I was a senior in college and playing ultimate frisbee, and we just played a game, and we were going to go. <clears throat> it was the end of the season. We were going to go out to a bar to celebrate the end of the season. And so I was wearing sandals, and I was on the bike, and I was going about as fast as I could. No helmet, of course, because I'm indestructible at this age. And there was a pothole in the road, and I didn't want to wipe out on the pothole, so I turned my wheel. My sandal came forward, got stuck in the spokes, dragged my foot in. So now the front wheel stops. Now I'm going as fast as I can. So of course the bike endos with my foot stuck in the wheel. No helmet, but I'm wearing a backpack with all my clothes and my cleats and all that stuff. It swings over my head, and I land face first into my backpack. I was out for a minute or so, and somebody came from around the street, like literally a couple hundred yards away, heard the accident. Bike was completely destroyed. So if the backpack hadn't come over my head, I probably would have been in really, really bad shape. Um, which is, again, why do people get into things like studying traumatic brain injury in neuroscience? Well, because we have these, I was already a neuroscience to the point, but we have these personal stories that kind of attract us to one topic or another. Um, I now, of course, wear a helmet every time I'm out there. So now I'll go back to my scientific method slide. Now I've told you my background. So why is traumatic brain injury important? Why are we studying this? What are my interests? Well, that's all those slides that we just talked about. And now I have to get into this idea of my hypothesis, which is discrete and testable. So does anybody here know how to define a hypothesis? I know you've all learned about the scientific method, so you should all be experts from your high school experience. So can anybody really define a hypothesis? That's very. That's a really good answer, actually. <laughs> I'm very highly impressed. So you, you hit on a couple points. It's, it's. This was Webster's dictionary. A tentative assumption made in order to draw out a test and logical empirical consequences. Right. So it's still kind of complicated. And in Wikipedia said a proposed explanation for an observable phenomenon. So you can see it's actually pretty hard to describe a hypothesis simply, even though this is what we always do. And so it is. It's kind of. You don't necessarily know the answer, but you have a question and an idea about how that question is going to be answered. And what you have to do is come up with a discrete, right? It's something very testable, something where you can ask a very specific question, apply a very specific method to ask to address that question to get an answer to see if your hypothesis is right, wrong, or other. And I will say with hypothesis, you know, I got into grad school and I thought I was really good at this, and I was slammed for six years. That you got to get your hypotheses better. You got to get your hypotheses better. You got to get your hypotheses better. And one of my good friends who's in the field, he's about four years ahead of me. Last year, my my dissertation mentor said, you know, Johnny finally got it. He's 38, 39 years old, and this time he's finally got his hypotheses. They look like a grown-up set of hypotheses. So it's not a trivial thing to do to design really good hypotheses to ask very specific or discrete questions um, to, that you can test. So we'll get to my hypothesis, um, and I'm going to start with what most people believe. Traumatic brain injury is a relatively new study, uh, field of study. It was always assumed that you hit your head in a car accident or a football injury or something like that. The injury happens. By the time I get you to the hospital, what, we, what can we do? It was two hours ago. And what people found out about a lot of these things, whether it's stroke or traumatic brain injury, seizures, is that you actually do have a window. Everything doesn't happen at once. It's initiated but then it takes a period of time for everything to go wrong. Um, so what everybody focused on was this idea of cell death. When you're injured, cells die. So um, what they think was cell death caused behavioral dysfunction. So when people had injuries and they weren't doing well in school or they couldn't do their dancing anymore, it was because cells died. And that if they applied a drug that would prevent the cells from dying, the outcome would get better. So we've had... Uh, Somewhere near 70 clinical trials, most of them looking at preventing cell death. Does anybody want to guess how many of those trials came out well? Zero. 
So none of these drug tests have worked. They work great in rats. They work great um, in all of our cell culture models, but they don't seem to work very well in humans. And that gets to my hypothesis. Question. Yeah, question. How do you judge you try that? So it's a good question. So when have you guys learned anything? I guess you guys haven't learned anything about cell death, right? So the way cells die is there are genes. And when the cell goes into distress, the genes transcribe proteins. And these proteins will go and destroy the cell. So they'll cause the cell to kill itself. So there are several ways you can keep a cell from dying. One is you can try to prevent those genes from being activated in the first place. So if you know, and I'll, I'll show a picture of this, that a lot of calcium goes, comes into a cell, calcium causes the mitochondria to explode. And we all know that mitochondria make ATP, right? And so if your cells stop making ATP, that's really bad, and they, that triggers a signal for them to go on to die. Um, another way would be once you actually trigger cell death, there are these proteases. So these are just enzymes whose job it is to chop the cells up into little bits. Well, okay, you can block the activity of the proteases. You can put on a drug that stops them, and that will prevent the cells from dying. So there's a lot of different strategies for trying to prevent cells from dying. And that's what people invested a lot of time and money in is, which is the best strategy. Another way is to try to keep the cells from being active. So one of the biggest clinical trials that's ongoing right now is they freeze people. So you take somebody who's just had a head injury and you're, you make them hypothermic, you cool them down. So what that does is it slows everything down. So everything that would be bang, bang, bang after an injury, all this activity and, and slows it way down, causes the cells to kind of relax, then you keep them cold for like two weeks. So they're unconscious clearly when you're doing this because they're sitting in an ice bath. Um, and that prevents cells from dying. So there's a lot of different ways. That's why I came up with my hypothesis. That's the perfect question, right? If cells are supposed to die, then why would you try to save them? I mean, if you take somebody and you cut off their arms and legs, and then you ask them to go, you know, rake the leaves, it's not possible, right? You can't rake the leaves without arms and legs. So if you ask a cell to... Um, do its job, but you've cut off its axons and its dendrites, it's not going to be able to do its job. And I'm going to address this point a little bit more in a second. Um, so what I did with my hypothesis is I said that brain injury causes not just cell death, but cells to be dysfunctional. And if you save cells, like you just said, you're probably going to end up with more dysfunctional cells. And then I said, instead of just cell death causing behavioral dysfunction, it's cell death and cell dysfunction that lead to behavioral dysfunction. And that treatment with a drug that prevents, only prevents cell death is just going to create more dysfunctional cells, which aren't going to help you out. And that therefore, and, and bold my big thing, is treatment that reduces both cell death and dysfunction is going to lead to your best outcome. So again, here's that old uh, axon with an action potential. This is how we normally work, right? You get glutamate in the synapse and the calcium and the sodium coming in and potassium going out and the signal going down. So when you have traumatic brain injury, you don't have one action potential. You have lots and lots and lots of action potentials, which cause lots and lots and lots of glutamate to re be released in the synapse, lots of calcium to come into the cells. And then what happens? And so, like I said, this would be the old hypothesis, is you have traumatic brain injury. Some cells seem to be fine. They don't get hurt at all. Some cells go on and die. And then other cells are, are, I have this angry cell. So if you've had a traumatic brain injury, the likelihood of you getting seizures goes up. The likelihood of you getting Alzheimer's disease when you get older goes up. The likelihood of Parkinson's disease goes up. And a lot of times they think it's because you get these cells which are hanging around and doing, not just not doing their job, but doing the wrong job. And by doing the wrong job, they make your nervous system go south. And I think you also have, you know, like I said, you have someone with no arms and no legs and you ask them to rake the lawn, it's not going to happen. You have these cells that are alive, but really just not doing anything. And the prevailing belief in our field is you, you put on your therapy to reduce cell death and the dead guys go away and, and you have nice happy cells. Um, but I really believe that the dead guys go away and you get more of this, which isn't really going to solve your problem. So there you have my hypothesis, is that we need to treat both death and dysfunction to really get a better outcome. So how do you test this? Uh, one is I need a way to injure my cells. So I'll describe that to you. And then I need a way to quantify cell death, right? If I want to reduce cell death, I need to be able to count how many cells there are in one case and count in another case and compare. 
um, I need a way to quantify cell function, right? It has to be something testable. And then I'm going to need a drug that I'm interested in. And what's most important whenever we're doing any sort of scientific method, whether it's in hard sciences or other, is you need something to control them to or your controls. Um, you always need controls. It's important for several reasons. Um, it gives you a way to compare your data within a study, right? So if I take a year to do a study, I'm going to have many different examples. If I don't have controls every week, I don't know if something changes from week to week. So it lets me compare my data with my own my own data. Um, also, something like the placebo effect. Have you guys heard of a placebo effect? You take a sugar pill and you get better. So if I put on a drug and I don't have a non-drug control, how do I know it's not just putting fluid on the cells? And we've actually shown that sometimes just putting saline on a cell without any drug in it will make the cell better. Um, the other thing that's important is if I want to make a statement, I want to get out there and tell the community I've got this important contribution to the larger research that's going on, I have to be able to compare my research with their research. So controls allow us to compare research between labs and across the world. Um, and it's a way to make sure your experiment didn't go haywire. And so you need these in everything you do. And uh, if you don't have adequate controls, you'll send your data to a, a journal and you'll say, publish this, and they'll say, uh, we don't believe your data because you don't have the right controls. I've had friends who this has happened to. And you have to go back and do the whole thing again. And that can take a year or two. And I, I kind of throw this out there rhetorically, can there be too many controls? And the answer to that is yes, too. There's probably a gazillion controls. You don't need to do every one because you'd spend your whole life doing that. So, uh, all right, still my, my, my design. We have cells that are injured, so this is my test group, and I have cells that are uninjured, my control group. And what I tried to do for the rest of this is keep all of my test groups in red and my control groups in green, just so you can see where my controls are. Um, so I'm going to break my design into, t into three parts, AIM 1, A, and B. I split these cells into two groups. One I count death, and one I look do some cell imaging to look at function. And then I do a drug treatment. So the drug would be my test, and I have a placebo control, or a non-drug control. And I'm going to use these three aims to determine whether a drug can affect both cell death and dysfunction. All right, so my cell death me methods. I'm going to injure cells in a culture, and I'm going to show you this in a second, what this looks like, when they're two weeks old. And it's always when they're exactly two weeks old. Then I'm going to wait three days, fix them, and do some staining, some immuno. So do you guys know anything about immunochemistry? Do you guys know anything about immunology, like how when you take a, uh, a antibi uh, sorry, uh, when you get a vaccination, how that works? Want to give it a shot? Exactly. So there's a surface protein that your immune system recognizes, and it activates a response to come up with a way to kill the cells that aren't supposed to be there. So every cell in our body has lots of surface proteins. For example, they have receptors. They have structural proteins. In this case, MAP2 is microtubule-associated protein 2, which is a structural protein. And so this is probably the earliest version of biophotonics in neuroscience, is they come up with an antibody for a structural protein. So what they do is they take this structural protein, say, from a rat, and they'd inject it into a mouse. And what the mouse would do is recognize this foreign protein and make antibodies, and make antibodies, and make antibodies. And so any time, so you could take the blood out and spin it down and collect the antibodies, and within these antibodies are these, these antibodies that recognize this protein MAP2. So if you take a rat now and you put on these antibodies from the mouse, all of the MAP2 antibodies will bind to the MAP2 proteins on the rat. So now you have an antibody that binds an antigen. Okay, that doesn't get you very far. So what they do now is they have what's called a secondary, and the secondary is a fluorescent probe, and that's attached to an antibody that recognizes all mouse proteins. Right? So now you have this mouse antibody bound to the antigen on the rat cell, and you put on a fluorescent probe with an antibody that recognizes all mouse proteins. So wherever this MAP2 is stuck on a MAP2 protein in a rat, there will be a fluorescent particle associated with it. I should have a figure for that and make it easier, but it's a way of uh, staining your tissue. So I have I have some stains that I put on, and then I'm going to count them to assess whether injury causes cell death or not. And so this is what antibodies look like. So the green here is that 
MAP2, or that structural protein for neurons, and you can see quite clearly there's some beautiful looking cells with these dendrites. It doesn't stain the axons. Um, I also have this red, so that's a structural protein for the support cells in the nervous system, the glia. So you can see quite clearly the red and green cells. And so these, this is what they look like when they're about two weeks old. And then what we do is we grow these cells. So those are fixed cells. But what we do is we grow them basically on a rubber band. And what's nice about a rubber band is you can deform it. And so we have this cell injury controller, which injects a very fixed amount of air right over the rubber band, and it deforms it. And so you bend the cells. And what that does is it puts a kind of mechanical strain on it. And the guy who first designed this device was looking at human head injury and looking at how the brain actually moved, like using x-ray during an injury. And he said, this model here actually mimics one of the types of strains you see during concussion. So it's a way to model an aspect of concussion. And so what I do, remember I have my green neurons, my red astrocytes, is I can do an injury. I can wait 72 hours and just count how many of these there are. Because when they die, they disappear. They float away. And so I can physically say the question, okay, here there's three. If I did injury, maybe there'd only be one. And that's how I count cells. And it's really dependent on biophotonics here for me to be able to see them. And so this is what the data look like. So again, I have my controls. I have some cells that are uninjured. So I have to know how many cells are usually in a well. And then I did either a mild, a moderate, or a severe stretch. So I just increased the amount I stressed them, stretched them. The amount of time it took to get stretched and come back was the same, but just how much. What you can see is when I just do a small stretch, there are the same number of cells in the mild and control. When the stretch is moderate, there's almost a 50% reduction in the number of cells in a well. And when the stretch is severe, there's less than a quarter. So I know I can kill cells, and this is how I can quantify them. Okay, so that, that's part one. Okay, go ahead. Well, okay, that's always a good question. So you know what these guys are here? They're... There, this is called a standard error. It's an error. And so what, what you predict is if I had, if I took another random sample, like if you're picking marbles out of a bag, in all likelihood it would fall somewhere between here and here, and again here and here. So statistically these are identical. I mean 100 versus 102, it's statistically identical. Uh, but I've had this in a couple cases and I don't know why that happens. Okay, so that's, that's cell death. The second part will be cell dysfunction. So remember here's our Uninjured neuron, action potential comes down, glutamate release, sodium and calcium, and then the signal goes down. Well, in an injured guy, here we have red, what I think sometimes happens is the signal changes. So this is like a couple of days later, so you have one action potential go down. Well, what happens if that action potential stimulates more glutamate release than before? This can happen. Then you have more calcium than before, and then you have instead of one action potential coming out the back, you have a lot of action potentials coming out the back. And so this is a model of dysfunction. One action potential should cause this much activity. What happens if one action potential causes this much activity? Can I ask that question? And using biophotonics, I actually can. Um, so again, cells were injured when they're two weeks old, and this time I waited a certain period of time, one hour up to 72 hours post-injury to look at them, and what I did is I looked at free calcium in these cells. So again, see this calcium that accumulates? So when there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of calcium. When there's a little activity, there's only a little calcium. Um, and then what I did is I put on a stimulating concentration of glutamate. So again, something I thought would cause like one or two action potentials, not a ton of action potentials. And I saw how they behaved. And so here's where biophotonics comes into play. There's this dye called Fura2 which is a ratiometric dye. And what that means is that there's, and I'll show you the figure for this, there's two different excitation peaks, right? So remember for fluorescence with that excitation, you shine in a light at a certain wavelength and excites the particle, it emits, and then it goes back down. So there's an excitation wavelength and an emission. So there's two different excitation peaks, one at 380, and that's when there's no calcium. And then there's one at 340, which means there's a lot of calcium in the cell. I think I have that right. Regardless of where you stimulate, they both emit at 510 nanometers. So normally there's no free calcium in cells, so you have a lot of the signal for no free calcium and, and very little signal for free calcium. When cells are stimulated, calcium goes up and you see a change. So instead of no free calcium, there is. So there's a change in ratio. So you're looking at these changes in ratio. So 
one of the reasons this is advantageous, I think I, I put these in here, um, I didn't put this in here, let me go back, is can anybody tell me what the problem is with shining light on a, a fluorescent compound over a period of time? What happens? If I keep shining light on a piece of fluorescence, does it stay bright for hours and hours and hours? I can just keep shining light on it and it stays bright. Now what happens? It bleaches. This is the word. So it bleaches out. So I keep pumping in photons and the signal I get out is less and less and less and less. So a lot of times if you're doing an experiment like this, you see less and less and less signal. Does that mean there's less and less calcium or does it mean your dye is just bleaching? But here what we're doing is we're comparing a ratio of the same dye. So it's the same dye excited at two wavelengths, so it bleaches evenly the whole time. So no matter how much you bleach this dye, as long as any fluorescence is coming out of it, you can get a ratio, which means you can use this dye to look at calcium over a long period of time, which is why they use it. And so again, this is what, what it looks like. When there's calcium, you get an excitation peak at 340, and when there's no calcium, at 380. And so this was like a little experiment they did. So 340 and 380, they're kind of humming around, you get a ratio. And agatis means like they put on glutamate to stimulate calcium to come in. So when calcium comes in, the 340 signal goes up and the 380 signal goes down. So your ratio completely changes. And then as the agonist dissipates, right, diffuses away, the ratio comes back to normal. And here they just permeabilize the membrane. So all the calcium in the media comes in and again it goes up and you get this, this ratio. And that's how the dye works. And so I ask a simple question. I'm going to stimulate the cells do they respond the same way? Is the ratio going to be the same? So I have here a one hour post-injury and a 48 hours post-injury. Here I have the change in ratio on the y-axis in both cases. And here I have the time. And my controls are in green and my uh, injuries are mild in this case and they're in the red. And so here's your baseline here. And so, okay, I wait five minutes. I put on the glutamate to stimulate them and the controls go up to about two. So the ratio changes twofold. And it kind of hums along there because I keep stimulating them and stimulating them and stimulating them. After a mild injury, when I stimulate one hour later, there's this diminished response. So at one hour, the cell is responding differently. If I wait 48 hours, this is a different culture, uh, a different cultures. Again, the, the control here in the green, um, if you look at the axis, it's right around two. So it's about a doubling. So that's about what controls do. But 48 hours after a mild injury, the injured cell responds with a 2.5. So remember I showed in that figure way back there that there's more calcium now all of a sudden. The signal has changed. I put in the same stimulation, and now I'm getting a different output. So to me, this is a measure of dysfunction. These cells are not behaving normally. And so that gives me, now I can say I have a way of addressing using biophotonics whether cells die, and I have a way of addressing using biophotonics whether cells are functioning. And then part C would be, can I put on a drug that actually blocks these things, right? And so this is, you know, my, my boss and I have been working with this drug called HDAC, which is a histone deacetylase. So everybody here knows what DNA is, right? And everybody knows that DNA codes for proteins, right? And does everybody know what a histone is, that DNA wraps around histones, and that you have to unwrap it from the histones for the, protein to be ex uh, the DNA to be exposed for proteins to be made, right? So one thing maybe you could do, there, there, remember I said there are genes that are transcribed that cause the cell to die? earlier. There are also genes that can be made that cause a cell to survive. And the idea here is what would happen if we could force the DNA to stay unwrapped only for the cell, for the proteins that cause cell survival. And there actually is something that does that. So these, these HDACs here are what usually cause the DNA to wrap back up. So when the HDAC is active, the DNA wraps back up on the histone. So if we have an inhibitor, it keeps the DNA open. And one of them, HDAC6, keeps the DNA open specifically for um, transcription of protective proteins. So that's what I have here. Uh, proteins specifically thought to upregulate the cells. So like down here, you see the black wrapped around the histones is the DNA. When they're open, the DNA is exposed and be can, tra can be transcribed. So we wanted to know if we put on these pro-life genes, can we actually save the cells and what will that do to the function? So what we do here is we have that same injury model, right? You notice I'm doing everything. Cells are two weeks old and I injure them. It's this very controlled experiment. I do it the same every time. Then I waited 30 minutes post-injury and treated them with the, uh, the, the drug to try to save them. Anybody guess why I waited 30 minutes? Kind of 
So the vast majority, for the first like 20 years in our field, everybody would give drugs right away in their experimental design, and they would work great, and then they never worked in the field. And one of the reasons they never worked in the field is we never see patients in the first five minutes. We see patients, if we're lucky, in the first 30 minutes. Um, the ambulance can certainly see a patient and inject a drug within 30 minutes. So we wait a period of time to make sure that uh, we're looking at something we can do clinically. And the drug was called KB343. Um, then 72 hours afterward, we fixed the cells and stained them to count. And uh, then we also, I didn't throw this in here because I haven't done the experiment yet. This is what we're actually doing in the lab last week and next week, is we're looking at the function of these cells. And uh, this is the, the data I've finished so far. So this is like the first test, right, the, the injury test. So here I've got my uninjured. And here what I've got is my injured. This is a moderate injury with a vehicle, so no drug. So you notice now all of a sudden an injury has become a control. And the reason my injury is a control now is I had my first experiment, which shows that a mild injury causes no cell death, a moderate injury causes 50%, and a severe injury causes 25 then I have to make sure when I do my test with the drug that the injury is still doing what it's supposed to do. So here's my injury with no drug, and it's right at 50%, so I know my injury is still working. And I have had occasions, you, you think you just, you're bending a rubber band, injury always works, doesn't always work. So it's important to have this control. So we know that, that, that we have the right amount of cell death. And then when we put on different concentrations of these, uh, this uh, drug, we're actually seeing that the cells aren't dying. So it works. It seems to be causing these pro-life genes to be expressed and the cells not to die. Now somebody, again, there was a question, why do I see greater than 100%? And I do have a hypothesis about this. You think cells survive really well when you take them outside of the brain? They don't survive that well. So if you grow a culture of neurons, they'll last about four weeks and you'll start with 100 cells and go down to 50 cells. And so they're constantly dying over time until there's no neurons left. So what I think this is a function of is those neurons that just randomly die on their own in the culture, I'm saving them too. I'm not just saving the ones that are injured. I'm saving the ones that are just getting old in the culture. So that's probably why that's happening. OK, so let's, let's go back to the beginning and say I, I had this hypothesis that brain injury causes death and dysfunction. Death and dysfunction in us will cause behavioral dysfunction, and that um, a drug that only prevents cell death will create more dysfunctional cells, and treatment that blocks both will actually give us our best outcome. And so can I come up with um, methods and aims to actually address these questions? So my first aim said, does injury cause cell death? And yeah, of course it does. Um, can injury cause cell dysfunction, and can I actually measure it? Well, my second experiment showed that I do have a way of assessing whether an injury causes dysfunction. Does treatment with a drug reduce cell death and dysfunction? And so far, it does reduce death. And right now, I'm collecting the data to see if it reduces dysfunction. My guess is going to be no. Because if you think about it, I'm targeting a cell that's already had so many things go wrong. And I'm just triggering proteins that are going to keep the cell alive. And that's what I'd actually expect from the drug we're using. But maybe the trick will be in the future to pick a drug, a second drug to go along with, with this one. This one's good at saving cells. Maybe a second drug that helps with cell function. OK. So there is still some key parts to this, to this uh, scientific method. Now that I've got my data, what does it really mean? And how does it figure in with the rest of the world? Um, so what I've shown you is that at one time point, We've reduced cell death, and I can compare this to other data. And I can see how this, how this time point compares between all the different labs that do this kind of model. And I can also look, have other people used this drug, and what concentrations have they used it, and have they seen similar effects? Have I maxed it out? Can I still get better? Um, am I too high, where other people have shown that over time it will be toxic? So I can take all this information, I can kind of compare it, and use it to come up with the new hypothesis. And this part's really important because if there's no new hypothesis, then I'm out of a job, right? Because this is what I do for my living is I test hypotheses. So you get good at coming up with these. So we've done all this. What do I do next? What justifies them keeping me here at UC Davis? Um, what about different drug variants? Remember I said I used a really specific histone deacetylase inhibitor that just lets these few proteins be transcribed extra. Well, what if I used a different histone deacetylase inhibitor that had more proteins or less proteins being transcribed, um, for example. 
what about time points of durations of treatment? So I'll ask you this question. So say you've had a head injury. Um, is it important how you feel two weeks from now? Sure, right? Is it important how you feel two years from now? Right? It's very important how you feel. You have a long life in front of you. The vast majority of experiments in traumatic brain injury look at the first two weeks. And the reason this happens, and it's not a big surprise, is my department's neurological surgery. So I'm employed by the neurosurgeons. Guess how long the neurosurgeons see these patients for? Two weeks. After two weeks, they go to neurologists or rehab docs. So if you look at all of the traumatic brain injury research that's out there, it's all focusing on the first two weeks post-injury because we're all coming out of the departments of neurosurgery. So there's very little data that looks at durations of treatment and how this affects people in the long term. So something might be really good at preventing cell death or dysfunction in two weeks and not very good two years from now. And people with head injuries care very much about two years from now. Um, I showed that I just used a moderate injury. What if it's severe? What if it's mild? What if instead of doing a strain, I did something more like an ischemic injury, like stroke, I caused stroke in the cells, or something like a seizure, because you can cause cells to seize. Uh, and then the other question is, so remember I said what's happening is we're making pro we're causing the, pro the cell to make proteins that keep it alive, right? That's what the HDAC is supposed to do. Did any of my data show you that I was actually doing that? Right? The whole idea of a placebo effect is you put on a sugar pill and all of a sudden the person feels better. How do I know my drug is actually doing what I say it's doing? And this is very important if you want to get a drug out to people getting it through the FDA and into hospitals, is you need to actually show the drug is doing exactly what you say it's going to do. So there's all these ideas of where I can go next. Probably the most important one is, can I do this even in a rat? I've shown this in cell culture. Nobody really cares about cell culture. The advantage of cell culture is I can do a lot of them very quickly and it's cheap. Um, but if it doesn't work in a rat, let alone a human, then who the heck cares? Right? Because what this is really all about is how to help human patients who've had a head injury get better. Um, so what I hope I've covered in this pretty long period of time is some basic neuroscience and what I think are some very cool neuroscience studies. I'm always trying to recruit people into the fray. The more neuroscientists we have, the more people we have studying these diseases, uh, the sooner we'll get to a, a therapy. Um, I hope I've shown you a little bit about the integration of neuroscience and biophotonics, both in some of those early studies as well as in my studies. I also hope that you saw a little bit how the scientific method really works, right? I absolutely apply this every day of my life when I'm in the lab, and uh, it's really dictated how we design these experiments, how we test these experiments. And again, how I've used biophotonics, both with the immunology, or the immunochemistry, and the uh, calcium imaging to really address these issues. And um, here's my, my second quick survey. Remember, I, I can tell you, I remember the answer to this. None of you wanted concussions. Um, so none of you have had a head injury in auto accidents, right? Because I asked about concussions and nobody said that. So how many of you wear your seatbelts? All right, so how many of you have had concussions in an auto accident again? Okay, so none, but you all wear seatbelts. So why? Why do you wear a seatbelt when you're in the car? What? Right, so you don't get a head injury. Because if you get a head injury, you're going to be in bad shape. All right, how many of you, you wear a helmet every time you ride a bicycle? You better now, after three years. All right. So you just told me you all wear your seatbelts because you don't want a head injury, right? But you don't wear your helmet on the bicycle. And I have to ask you, um, why are you here? You're here to get an education because your brain is important to your careers. It doesn't matter what your hair looks like. It doesn't matter if it's uncomfortable. You guys really got to wear your helmets. And this is just an illustration of how good helmets are. Thanks for ESPN and Sean White for inspiring this. I don't know if any of you watched the half pipe, but this is actually just a few weeks ago in the X Games. So this is before the Olympics. And this is one of Sean White's practice runs. Uh, did anybody see this before? I mean, this is pretty awesome to me. One, it's, I love snowboarding and watching Sean White. He's absolutely phenomenal and does crazy things and wears a helmet every time he snowboards, like I do. Um, but what's going to happen here, uh, he's doing really well so far. But on the next jump, he's going to get out of position. And you can see he recognizes it by where his hand position goes, and boom, there goes his helmet. So there's a block of ice on the top of the half pipe, just a sheet of ice. And he came down and he hit his forehead, actually his helmet, the forehead of his helmet, right here, right on that block of ice. Knocked his helmet straight off of his head. Right? How much force does he have? He's probably 10 feet above that he comes down. 
Does anybody know, did he get a concussion from this? No, no concussion, no head injury, right? That's how good your helmets are. That's what they can do. We even had a, we had a patient once who didn't make it. He fell off a 100-foot cliff off of a bicycle, landed on his head, and he lived for a couple days. He was in bad, bad shape. 100 feet's a little bit high even for a helmet. But that's how much force these helmets can, can absorb. Um, and uh, head trauma is really bad. You really don't want to get this. You're young, and it's something that can affect you for your whole entire life. Uh, we had a summer student, actually, in the summer program for CBST who had something fall on her head, something that's completely unavoidable, right? It was an accident. And she's had headaches now for three years, right? Uh, I've had another person who I've known who's felt he's had depression-like symptoms now for three years because one of the symptoms you can sometimes have from trauma is to be very similar to what a depressed person is like. Just they can't get out of bed every morning. And it's something you really don't want to have. And um, I mentioned before that we've had 60 or 70 clinical trials and 100% failures. The only way to treat head injury is to not get a head injury. And so like this is an example here of a, this is me in the middle at Lake Tahoe three years ago. That's the grad student in the lab, Justin. Kim, our technician, is too cool to wear a helmet. Justin actually had a pretty bad accident that day. Ended up going to the hospital. Um, but he's giving me the thumbs up. It's hard to tell. His head wasn't hurt, just his arm. And uh, he wears his helmet every time. So thanks so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. And any more questions? questions. Go ahead. <laughs> Probably not. One thing about, there's a couple things about rats, and, and a couple things about, uh, there's a couple things about rats. One is they seem to be able to recover from things better than we can, right? Um, I used to work in chronic pain models, and we'd do nerve injury, and we'd do a nerve injury very similar to what was seen in humans, and humans would never recover, and rats would recover in about two months. Why? Because their system has ways of dealing with the problem that we seem not to. Like for example, their immune systems are so much better than ours. Our immune systems are horrible. Rats, you can, you know, dirt can get in. They don't get sick. They just really have very strong immune systems. Um, another problem is, remember, I'm talking about function in a lot of cases, like behavior, and that's what people do. So they say, okay, we have a behavioral task where we ask the rat to remember a way through a maze or to remember, does it, does it know this object and not know this object, right? So how many people here spend their life going through mazes and remembering objects, right? So we're asking questions about rat memory, which might not really apply to human memory, which I think is one of the big problems. Um, and again, a lot of the things that I'd ask for us, like when I'm looking at complex human behavior and whether a drug affects that, well, the rats don't have those behaviors, so I really couldn't take it back. But I will tell you that one of the, one of the cool things about working in neurosurgery as a neuroscientist, like I'm a PhD, not an MD, is that my surgeons and I actually work together. So when I see something in the lab, I tell them, you know, we saw this in the lab. Do you see this in the humans? Yes or no, right? Because if they see a similar phenomenon, maybe I can ask some of those questions in the lab. On the other side, they say, we saw something different in the OR today. And, and I've noticed, you know, I went back over the data and I realized it really wasn't the first time. We just didn't notice it before, but we've seen it 10 or 20 times. Can you make this happen in a rat? Because if we can go back and replicate what we see in a human in a rat, then we can model it and try to come up with studies. Because ethically, like, I can't take you guys and bop you over the head and send you to the neurosurgeons and do uh, science on you, but we're allowed to bop rats over the head and do neuroscience on them. That's a fantastic question, right? So the, the, the question was about brain plasticity. And we all know that the younger we are, the faster we learn, right? And so, you know, I worked with a pediatric neurologist, and that's actually the question he really focuses on. And it can actually go both directions. So, for example, and I just lectured the neurosurgeons about this uh, two weeks ago. Do you guys ever heard of a hemispherectomy before? You have, you have. So it's where they take out a whole hemisphere of your brain. And the reason they do this is because you have seizures as a child that are so bad that it's going to, you're not going to have any quality of life. And they've basically gotten to the point where the only way they can stop your seizures is by literally taking out half of your brain. And they only do this surgery until you're about five or six years old usually. And the reason is, is if you take half of a brain out of a three-year-old, that three-year-old can learn everything in its other half of the brain, right? 
If you take out my left half of the brain now, my speech will be gone forever. You can take a four-year-old, take out the left half of their brain, their speech will come back. That's how it works. So they have this innate plasticity when they're young, and they seem to be able to respond and react to it and get better. But the flip side is that you have this normal course of plasticity, right? Your brain is growing, like that slide I showed from the cortical window where the synapses are changing during behavior. Well, what happens if you interrupt that pattern, right? So now when you go to school, like say you're, you're instead of being a college kid and you have to miss a year of school from a head injury, you have to miss all of third grade. Well, your mind's really good at third grade of absorbing things. Now you've pushed yourself back a year, right? So now by the time you get to 12th grade, you should be college. So there's that aspect. And there's also just plasticity. Does plasticity change? So we have evidence that plasticity does change. So like the girl in the crosswalk who was an A student now goes back and is a B student, it seems like her nervous system is unable to learn the way it used to learn. So it can work both ways. Plasticity is good, plasticity is bad. So there's white, so the, the cells are gray matter, and then they send projections, right, the axons and dendrites, and they get coded in a myelin, which basically increases conductivity so the signals go faster. And <clears throat> these fibers in the brain, the way the right talks to the left is through the corpus callosum. So if you, cut, you look at the brain, there's this huge white matter area in the middle, which is all the, the, the information from the right side going to the left and left side going to the right. And one of the things they do is they'll cut the corpus callosum in half, right? So no longer will the left talk to the right. And the idea is seizures is basically when your whole brain is active all the time, if you cut it in half and this side can't talk to that side, maybe you can interrupt that. <clears throat> and it works in some cases. But what happens is your right side works and your left side works, but they can't talk to each other anymore. So one of the cool experiments they'll do is um, with your eyes, right? So like they'll put something in your right eye and because your right, your right visual field talks to your left brain, your left brain can see it, but your right brain can't. So if you try to do a right brain task with a right eye, right visual field exposure, nothing happens because your right brain can't see it. visual field, the left brain will see it, but the right brain won't because the fibers that go across aren't connected anymore. So both sides still work, they just can't work together. So that's what happens. And people learn ways of cheating, right? So because visual fields are both eyes, they, you'll turn your head, and now both eyes can see it. <clears throat> and so they learn tricks of compensating for the left brain not being able to talk to right. Any other questions? I want to thank our wonderful speaker on the So let's, we're going to end class a little early today, but if you have any questions about the lab or need to make up the lab, please come talk to me. Uh, and uh, some of you want to make some appointments on Friday, please come talk to me. Uh, I've got your list of what you're trying to do. I'm going to try to analyze that at night. And if you have any feedback on that, we have feedback before Friday meeting. And number five is a study meeting. Oh, yeah, we did receive some dates from one of the middle schools. I'm uh, just trying to see if I can get another middle school too before I send out the information you guys. The one of the schools that responded. So we're definitely letting you know about some date possibilities this Friday. Remember that some of you are having and I'm sure if you have any other questions, he's happy to share his email with you. Yeah. You can just write it down here. And Gene has been a wonderful mentor to some of, some of the students. In the past, well, to all the students that he's received, uh, you've had now how many undergraduate interns? Four? Four or five. Uh, and they've gone on to actually present at conferences, present posters. So he is one of our, uh, his, the lab that he's in, and Gene is one of the people that is involved in our undergraduate internship program. If any of you, I, I know I keep on harping on this, but if any of you I think that you want to go into science, it's really important to get a research experience, and ideally you don't get that research experience between your junior and senior year. Okay? Ideally you start getting that experience now, even get multiple years worth of experience. Uh, your initial experience can help you think about whether you want to pursue this type of a field, and some students in the past have done a, a summer of research and have decided that it's not their thing. 
some students go on and take a second or a third, and we've seen a lot of those students then get fellowships, uh, get better uh, choices and applications for graduate school, even better if they want to go to medical school. So getting the research experience early is quite important. It's a little bit harder to get early because you don't bring as much in terms of your background knowledge into the laboratory that you're trying to get into, but it is not impossible. We have had one to two students every year from this class come and do internships with us or with someone else, uh, I guess even up to three. Uh, so it is possible. If you're dedicated and really interested, it is possible to do that. I think some of you in here might already be doing some research, right? Nicole, you're doing some research in neuroscience. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, it is very possible. There are unpaid positions and there are paid positions. Of course, the paid positions are harder to get. But the unpaid positions are usually pretty straightforward to get. Professors like you guys. They like you guys because you're honor students and they tend to give you a little bit more opportunity to get into a lab early. Okay? So feel free to talk to me at any time about interest in doing a research internship, whether it's biophotonics or not. It doesn't really matter to me. What matters to me is that you get, if that's the path you think you might want to go down, is that you get some early experience. Okay?